to be done so that uh, in South Africa we can be able, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to meet their expectations. So um, that is what we do during the month of June. Basically, it's a month um, of doing everything that will advance the interests of the young people. Remember 45 years ago, um, in June 16, 1976, uh, the young people actually are the people who changed the course of our country. They are the ones who used their anger against uh, the use of Africa, uh, who used their anger against the use of Africans as a medium of instruction. And that grew and actually caused you know, the country to actually uh, go forward in terms of you know, the struggle against apartheid. So now today, 45 years later, we are able to celebrate our young people who are doing great things in different you know, parts of the world. Um, and today, um, you know, uh, it's time to then celebrate this young person called Anda. Um, I need to disclose uh, upfront that uh, Anda uh, is my niece, all right? Anda is my niece. Um, and so because she is my niece, um, other people will say that's nepotism. No, um, I've invited her because she has earned her stripes to be invited here. Um, to me, nepotism is when somebody who is not deserving uh, is actually given an opportunity over other people. So um, we also have invited somebody, um, somebody who's not new uh, to this channel, uh, Dr. Nomtanda Zodube, who is a neurosurgeon. Um, I will ask Nomtanda Zo a little later to interact with my niece because that's my niece's dream. So Nomtanda Zodube, Dr. Nomtanda Zodube is actually living the dream uh, of my niece. And it is so therefore important that uh, before the end of this session, I can actually allow some interaction between the two of them uh, so that she knows that uh, she is on the right track. Uh, it's a long journey ahead, but it's definitely a dream that's attainable. So with those words, welcome to everybody who has joined us. Uh, welcome to Dr. Nomtanda Zodue, and also just a uh, welcome um, to our special guest, Anda. Anda, welcome to the Dr. Fundi channel. Please Thank unmute you. yourself. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Right, 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 Anda. Is it, uh, what time is it that side? It is 10 a.m. Okay, all right. So uh, your mind is still rebooting, it's still in the morning, uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, Thank you very much, man, for allowing us to have this chat because I know you are a very busy person where you are. Uh, but from time to time, it's important. It's Father's Day. Um, you know, we are going towards the end of Father's Day here in South Africa. And you guys, that side, it's still early in the morning. Yeah. Now, uh, to kickstart our conversation, um, I just want you to share with our audience. Who is Anda? Um, okay, well, I am 22 years old. I just graduated from Johns Hopkins with a degree in neuroscience. Um, I am planning to do a master's this year, and I'm currently applying to medical school at this moment. So that is quite tough, um, but I will hopefully find out by the time like next year and then start medical school in the summer of next year. So then that's four years. And then after that, just continue the journey until I get to surgery. Um, I love to dance and I love to travel. So those yep. are things that I am passionate about. And yeah, that's a little snapshot of me. Beautiful, beautiful, Anda. So uh, you already mentioned the, that um, you like to travel. 
Um, you know, now I also know that in your early life, uh, you and uh, your globe trotting family um, used to go around Europe when you guys were based in France. You also spent some time in the US uh, and every year you guys go and visit a new country. How has that shaped you uh, as a person? You know, the fact that you have exposure uh, to different countries, different cultures, uh, different ways of doing things as a young person who is, um, you know, lucky enough to have that opportunity, how has it shaped you? Well, I mean, I definitely acknowledge and recognize that that is a huge privilege that I've been able to travel a lot. And I, I am very appreciative to my parents that they value travel as much as they do, because I think that it is just like such an invaluable experience to have to be able to see how other people just live. Um, I think the way it's shaped my perspective is more just seeing that despite where you are in the globe, humans are the same, like at a fundamental level. And I yeah. think that is just like interesting to see, like the way that we do things like customs and traditions, those things may be different, but like we're all trying to attain the same thing in terms of human connection. Um, so that's part of how it's shaped my perspective. But I also think that it has just showed me and taught me how to be grateful for what I have, especially when we go to, you know, more developing countries um, and you see how other people live, um, that definitely has taught me to be more grateful for what it is that I have and to be more reflective on my surroundings and my privilege. So that is also a very important thing that I've learned. Beautiful, beautiful. So of these many, many places that you've gone to, which one would you say, I would love to go back to that part of the world? Uh, and maybe which one you'd like to say, to say, uh-uh, I never want to set my foot there. <laughs> um, so I think that I would never go back to Georgia. It is in Eastern Europe. And my father was very excited to go there, but it did not pan out the way we had hoped. Um, it, it's very much, I think that like there's a, a strong lack of diversity in Georgia. And yeah. so like, walking around that country, you could just feel the eyes on us, looking yeah. at us like this anomaly walking through the streets, which was very uncomfortable. Um, so I think Georgia, I definitely would not go back to. I yeah. would love to go back to anywhere in Asia. Like Vietnam was really amazing. Um, Malaysia, I really enjoyed. Um, so yeah, I, I really just enjoy Asian countries for some reason. Um, yeah. So I would go back to any of those. Okay, no, that's, that's good. All right, uh, in my introduction, I mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, it's 45 years since, you know, um, the June 16 uprisings uh, in South Africa, when young people in Soweto, uh, they protested against the use of the language Africans, which was seen as a language of oppression. Uh, but that spiraled, be, you know, beyond education to actually, um, you know, led to, you know, it led to protests against many other forms, you know, of oppression uh, in our country. So we are actually in a space now as a country where we are a free country. Um, now, what I want to know then, as a South African, when you reflect on that kind of history, uh, looking back 45 years ago, obviously you, you were not even an idea by that time, but looking back uh, at that point, you know, where there were limited opportunities for people like you and me, and also reflect on 2021, where, you know, um, there are no limits. You know, what are your thoughts around that? I think that um, 
For me, I am very blessed in that I feel like because we are born free, at least my generation, we don't have race as like a direct hindrance to achieving our goals and our dreams, um, which was not a reality at that time. But at the same time, like it doesn't mean that racism poof went away, it doesn't exist and that we don't deal with um, yeah. some of the consequences of what happened back then. I just yeah. think that for us, at least in my own experiences, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but for me, it shifted into a more like subtle um, type of racism, something more like nuanced in like, you know, microaggressions and like biases that you can see in the people around you. Um, so those are the things that I think I've had to navigate, especially like going to school in South Africa. Um, I went to a predominantly white school. And so that was something that I had to navigate. And um, I think it's interesting when I think back on like some of the interactions that the black students had with teachers, you could see the difference between how they treated the students. And we, we were all getting the same education, but it was still trickier for the black students because they were being dogged on, they were being punished. And then at the same time, like when you're constantly being torn down, I think that you start to just fulfill that as well. And you lose like a sense of morale and um, I had seen some of the students that I thought had so much potential just go down a different path because like you're receiving all these messages from your environment that's telling you that you are this and that. And so they went down a different path. And that saddens me because I get sad when people don't get to live out their potential, especially when we are so lucky that we can actually get opportunities to fulfill these dreams that we have yeah. um so that's i think that's the biggest thing that i know yeah. just on that point you know um you're saying there were more subtle forms you know of uh, racism you know and and uh, i'll call it discrimination mm -hmm. uh, yeah but how did you navigate now as under how did you navigate that? How did you uh, make sure that uh, as much as there was that kind of situation, but you are able to actually focus on your studies uh, and show that, you know, actually human potential is the same? I think um, for a long time, and I think I still believe this, that um, being able to occupy a white space and like excel in that space is the best way for me at least to show that we have the same you know value as our white counterparts and yeah. so the goal was to do as well if not better than them in whatever activities it was and so I remember like I would be very proud of my blazer because like we would get colors and stuff and then yeah. like eventually you get an honest blazer so I think like once I got the honors blazer and I was walking around with that red blazer, it made me feel more secure because like that was an immediate indicator to other people that, you know, I am of value in the space that I am in, which, you know, it, it's discouraging to think that you need these like signifiers that like prime someone's mind before you interact with them. But yeah. I think that that made it easier for me to move through those spaces and to gain respect, let's say. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so by wearing the red blazer, it's a sign that, you know what? I'm not ordinary. Yeah. Or I'm not what you thought I am. Yeah, exactly. All right. And uh, any highlights during your high school years, you know, that you can remember, you know, achievements that you say, you know what? I put my mind into this, and, uh, you know, I achieved one, two, three. Um, I definitely think that the highlight was the honors blazer. I feel mm. like I was working towards that for a very long time. Um, Can you explain to us what this honors blazer is? 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so at, at my school, the honest blazer was when you got full colors in three different aspects of school life. So it could be academics, it could be service, leadership, what else? Performing arts. Um, so you had to get full colors in three of those fields, three or more. So I got full colors in academics, in performing arts, in service and in leadership. Um, and that's how I got my honors blazer. And so in order to get full colors, like you have to be involved in those activities for a number of years, because like when you first start, you only get like a certain type of colors and then you get half colors and then you get full colors and then you can get honors. So it's really like at the beginning of high school, you enter all those activities and then you work towards it so that by like grade 11, grade 12, you can get that honors blazer. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. And then there was something about uh, head girl and deputy head girl stuff. <laughs> what was that all about? Yeah, <laughs> we had a leadership team with head girl, head of house, um, heads of different aspects of school life, like head of music, head of different sports, things like that. Um, and I wanted to be head girl, of course. Um, and because in grade seven, we had had like a mini version of that. And yeah. I was like the head counselor in grade seven. So then at that point, I was like, now I want to be head girl. Um, yeah. I did not get it. I got head of house. And yeah. that was definitely a a challenging experience. Leadership was not easy um, in high school, I think, especially because like you are in between like the staff, the teachers and their yeah. expectations, but also the students and yeah. trying to somehow form a bridge between the two, even when the ideas just aren't coming yeah. together. So it was definitely a, a tough experience. And um, I did feel underappreciated from time to time, but yeah. at the same time, I, I really did like my house and that there were, there were a lot of kids in it that um, really I had good relationships with and yeah. I wanted to see do good things. So that did give us an opportunity to connect in yeah. a more deeper relationship through yeah. that leadership experience. So, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so now uh, let's get back then to your dream. You know, uh, all of us as human beings, we have got dreams. We've got things that we would like to work towards. So I want to know from you, at what point, uh, you know, in your life, uh, uh, during the secondary, you know, uh, level of education, at what point did you decide that, you know, out of these many things that I can do, but there is this one that I really, really want to aim towards. I decided that I wanted to pursue medicine in grade one, I think. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> I was watching a show called Untold Stories of the ER, which just has depictions of real life ER cases, yeah. um, but it's all the like really ridiculous, crazy ones. So mm -hmm. I had started watching that show and I was like, okay, well, I guess like I want to be a doctor. Um, and I, it just kept, it stuck until grade four was when I, I, I continued doing more research into the field and um, by the time I was in grade four, I was like, okay, I want to be a surgeon of some kind. And then I'm not sure when neurosurgery became the goal. I'm not sure at what point that became the goal, but I think it was probably after grade nine. Um, Cause I had my, I think I had my first shadowing experience sometime then. And I shadowed a pulmonologist um, and I enjoyed that experience, but I didn't feel like very excited about it. And yeah. so when I learned about the nervous system and the brain and all of those things and how many things aren't known about that field, then I realized that that's what was exciting to me and that I wanted to pursue neurosurgery. So, 
it's more been like from grade one and then just finding experiences that reaffirmed that decision. Yeah. What is it about uh, pulmonology that didn't excite you? I think just in general, um, when it comes to the different systems, like the, car, the, the heart and things like that, like the get, those systems, like I, I learned about those systems in high school, like in biology. Yeah. And it was very much like ABC, like this is what is happening. This is what we do. So at that point, I didn't know much. I just knew what I had learned and it seemed like I, I felt like I had mastered those systems. So I was like, OK, yeah. well, I know everything I need to know, which is definitely not true. But I had felt like I know everything I need to know about these different systems. This is not as exciting anymore. I don't know that much about the nervous system. So that's what I want to do. But now, after having done a lot of research, especially in pulmonology, um, I know that that was not true at all. And yeah. each field is very much exciting and there's a lot of research to be done in all of the different fields, um, but you're, you're stuck. Yeah. yeah. What about medicine excited you before you actually zoomed in into in neurosurgery? What is it about medicine that um, was an attraction to you? Considering that your dad is an engineer and your mom is a lawyer, I think it was just understanding how humans work. Um, that was something that I was really interested in. And also like the, I feel like the human body is, is, is like so perfectly designed and it really just makes me appreciate like what we are capable of. Like when you learn about the different mechanisms and pathways and things like that, um, like on like a cellular level, it's just like, you're like, wow, what, like, how is this even possible? And all of this is living within our own bodies. So mm -hmm. it, it, at that point, especially in grade one, it was more just like curiosity. It was, um, you know, an opportunity to explore within this body. It was like, the body is a playground and I am willing to explore in it. So that's what, at that point, attracted me to medicine. Okay. Uh, no attempts to push you towards engineering and other things. I'm just being naughty. <laughs> <laughs> there were none of those attempts. No, 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 that's fine. All right, so um, obviously once you settle that you want to do medicine and ultimately within medicine you want to be a, a, a neurosurgeon, and that's a long road, um, you must have then started to research, you know, what subjects do I need to do you know, and what kind of grades uh, should I work towards to increase my chances of being accepted to do that particular course? So just talk to us about that, you know, once your mind was settled on the field of medicine. Um, okay, yeah, well, obviously I did research into how to get to that point and it's very much just like a structured plan to get yeah. to medicine and yeah throughout the entire course of it you just have to have good grades that's the first thing um and also having a lot of like extracurriculars to show that you're oh, to show that you are a diverse human being who has interests outside of academics that is important so um i think those two things characterized um senior prep and high yeah. school for sure so that by the time I got to college, I would be able to get into those colleges. Yeah. Um, and I think that at least to get into medicine in South Africa, it really rides mostly on like how many distinctions you have. Um, yeah. So that was the most important thing was getting seven plus distinctions and the extracurriculars are just like a nice bonus, yeah. but for applying to the States, all of the things are very much important and you have to write essays as well that show who you are and what type of impact you would make in those universities. So being able to collect experiences that you can write about and like learn things from and show that they make you a unique, valuable person that is worthy of being accepted into these schools was important in that journey too. 
So you got your eight, um, you know, uh, distinctions uh, from Dayton. Um, how did that help you? Um, that definitely helped me for getting into medicine at UCT. Um, and of course it helped with getting into Hopkins, but with Hopkins, I don't know. You are summarizing there, Anda. I am? <laughs> yes, you're just jumping and summarizing. I want you to tell me, because there's a point where you have to decide, do I do my medicine in South Africa? Do I do my medicine oh, okay. in South Africa? Um, <laughs> you have to wait. Uh, for you to get, you know, to know whether you're accepted in the U.S., you know, that kind of thing. Let's, let's, let's move like that. Okay, okay, I understand what you're asking. Um, well, I, I think I decided probably in senior prep that, that that was when I wanted to do medicine in the U.S. Um, I had done a bit of research around neurosurgery and medicine in general, and I had learned that in the US, there was a lot of innovation and discovery that was happening in the field of medicine, particularly in neuroscience, and that I wanted to be a part of that. And also I wanted to like be at the best of the best as well. So it's when you just type in like top medical schools, I saw the US schools in that list. So around that time was when I decided that I wanted to do medicine in the States. Um, so throughout high school, I was obviously working towards that with the things that I was doing. And when it came around to ap applying um, to undergrad in the States, um, I, our calendar is different from the States. So like we finish November, December, but they finish in like May around yeah. summer. So that's when they finish and they also apply like differently. So the way that the calendars lined up meant that I had to apply um, after the matric and after I had received my results, whereas they apply in grade 11 um, to these institutions. So as a result, I had to apply to UCT to fill in the like eight month gap that I would have um, after matric, but also before finding out if I got into a university in the States. So that's why I went to UCT. And it was also like, if I didn't get in at all, then at least I would still be in medical school. Yeah. So that was the thinking in applying to UCT for medicine. And then- How, some, how long did you spend uh, at UCT? And how did you find the transition as well, you know, from uh, high school or college, yeah, from high school to varsity? Um, I was at UCT for one semester. So that's maybe like six months, I think. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't remember. Um, and the transition, I didn't feel like it was that big of a transition. I think that like I was, because in high school, I went and studied abroad for a couple months. I studied in New York. And I think like that prepared me the for- program. Pardon? I talk about the exchange program. Yes, the exchange program, yeah. So that prepared me for like living away from home. So I don't think that it was too difficult transitioning from high school to university. Um, but I will say that like, you do have to learn to motivate yourself when you go to university because at home and in high school, like you're directly living with your parents and they also motivating you to do well. But once you are living by yourself, it's just you and you are the one who needs to take yourself to the library and to go to classes because there's not as much supervision and the lecturers don't care if you come or not. So yes. it's very much like learning to motivate yourself and to push yourself to get your own dreams once yeah. you go to university. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so what would you say that six months that you spent in UC, you know, at UCT you know, um, what did you gain, you know, uh, and this is not necessarily academic mm -hmm. you know, life adjustment or anything, you know, I mean, what value when you look back, 
um, can you say this is what you know um, the six months gave to me uh, mm -hmm. before I could actually go overseas? I think that if anything, it was the most diverse place I had been up until that point because my high school was not as diverse. And so I, I was fortunate to have seen like a space where there's so many intelligent, smart people who look like me or look different from me. And that was amazing to see, um, to see like us doing well and occupying these spaces. Um, I think that also it showed me how tertiary education works in South so Africa and how like I appreciated some aspects of it, but also reaffirmed why I felt my decision to go to the States yeah. was a good decision for me and what I wanted to achieve. All right. So, and in your mind was medicine, neurosurgery, all right. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, around March, the results of your applications came, right? And where were you accepted? Um, I was accepted to UCLA and Duke and Johns Hopkins, so those three universities. Yeah. And, and so how did you make your choice then, you know, to say, yeah, I'm going to this one. The other two, I will give them a miss. I mean, I was very what, excited. What, 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 what went through your mind that yeah. helped you to narrow to say this one and not that one? Because obviously different universities have got different, you know, uh, characters. Yeah. You know, also is it in a, in a big city? Is it in a small city? Uh, and there's also, you know, a history of the type of, um, you know, people that they've produced. So mm -hmm. what made you to choose the one that you chose? Um, I think like while I was applying, I wasn't really thinking about like location or like things like that. I was really just looking at which one is the best <laughs> and which one will take me. Um, yeah. And UCLA is a very good school as is Johns Hopkins. So like the first thing was just that Hopkins has the prestige and it has the, the, the history of producing a lot of game changing innovation, especially within neuroscience and the neuroscience program is amazing. And because I want to pursue neurosurgery, I think that was what drew me to Hopkins um, instead of UCLA. So that was really the, the thing that swayed me. All right. So at this point, uh, I just want to um, let you interact with uh, Dr. Nomtanda Azur uh, Dume, who is a neurosurgeon. Um, a little bit about Dr. Nomtanda Azotube. She's a first black female neurosurgeon to qualify as a neurosurgeon from the Medical University of South Africa, Medunsa, right? Obviously there's different institutions in South Africa, but she was the first one out of Medunsa. It's now called, uh, I think, uh, uh, Sifako Mahato University. Uh, she trained there. Uh, and was the first female from that institution to pass, you know, the college exams of neurosurgeons. Um, and uh, at the time that she qualified, there were only 10, just 10 of black females who are neurosurgeons in South Africa. Oh my goodness. Okay? So, and this is just about three years ago. All right. So um, this is, you seem surprised, but yeah, yeah. this is, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, all right? So it's not very long, but since she passed, there's been a few more who have passed, but it's still a handful. Yeah. Uh, and the space is still very much um, a male-dominated space. She's going to talk a little bit about how they made life so difficult for her as a female, you know? But maybe let me allow you to just, uh, Dr. Dube, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, Doc. Hello. Hi. Dr. Dube, you know, um, thank you for agreeing at the 11th hour to actually just have a quick chat uh, with my niece, uh, Anda. Um, and the reason for me to come knocking at your door at the 11th hour is because you are living her dream. 
She wants to be a neurosurgeon in about eight years from now. Um, and you are already there. You are already occupying that space. So um, yeah, you, you, you can chat to her. Hi. Dr. Dube, you can chat to her. I think she's frozen. Oh. Hi, hi, hi Dr. Dube. Hi, okay. I don't know if it's my internet that's a little bit unstable. Hi, I don't know if it's my internet that's a little bit unstable. Can you hear me? Yeah, maybe switch off the camera. If, 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 if it gets too bad, you can switch off the camera and just continue the voice. But you can continue as you All right. Hi, Anda. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. How are you? Oh, but it's so lovely to meet you. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for coming today. <laughs> Uh, so, Doc? Yeah, I am. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, continue, Doc. Yeah, this is somebody um, who wants to emulate you. Yeah, so um, I was quite excited when I got um, the message from Dr. Nyati this morning um, telling me about you. Um, so, it's absolutely wonderful to meet you, and I'm very excited after hearing everything that you've just said. Um, we look forward to having you in our little circle, in our little growing circle of uh, Black female neurosurgeons in the country. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. So, Doc, um, maybe Ooh. just share with her a little bit of, you know, firstly, uh, now that you are a neurosurgeon, how have you found the space? Looking back, you know, um, what, what did you need to do to make sure that uh, that dream becomes a reality. Dr. Dube? Dr. Dube? So it's, it's a very exciting thing to do that much. Um, oh, you can't hear me. Okay, I'm going to switch up the video. Can you oh. hear me now? Yeah. Yes. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. So what I was saying is it's a very exciting space. Um, no two days are alike. Um, we, we do the most interesting things. So I think you've chosen very, very wisely. And I'm very, very biased because obviously it's my favorite subject. Um, so now um, the challenges are always there. You know, um, as a Black female, there's still so few of us that Sometimes when you walk into a space, um, they've never seen uh, someone like you. So um, half the time I'm mistaken for um, one of the sisters and they say to me, when is the doctor arriving? Or if I'm going to operate on someone, they ask me, how much experience do you have? Have you ever done this operation? Or whatever the case might be. It doesn't help that I'm short and it doesn't help that I'm blonde. Um, you know, that flies against all convention, <laughs> but um, it's what you say and it's what you do that convinces people that, um, you know, this person looks and sounds like they know what they're talking about or what they're about to do. So always, it's always about your best foot forward. Um, in terms of what I've been through, it's no secret that um, I had or a detractor, um, somebody who was not happy that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Um, when I arrived uh, in medical, not medical school, when I arrived um, to do the neurosurgery training, um, I was effectively told that neurosurgery is not for women. Um, I was effectively told that I wasn't good enough and that I would never become a neurosurgeon. Um, so these are some of the things that, you know, we, we, we come across. You know, you might not come across that. I know for a fact that in the US there's currently, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, movement because of all the racism, et cetera. So those are some of the things that you will probably um, come across. And, you know, it, it takes a lot. It, it takes a lot to keep you going but also your dream has to keep you going. Your, um, what you want, your determination has to, you know, those are the things that will keep you going. And especially if you show about what you want to do. I always say that um, 
you know if you're a surgeon and you know if you're not a surgeon. The minute you walk into theater, you'll know um, if you're a surgeon or not. The day you see the brain, you'll know if you're a neurosurgeon. And I say the first time I brain pulsating was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And I've never looked back. So you will know if you're a surgeon. And that is what will keep you going. Um, you'll meet a lot of challenges. Like I said, in our black skin and us being women, we experience um, the hardest pushback, you know. Um, we always have to prove ourselves. And like you said, you had to wear the honors um, uh, blazer when you are in high school to prove that you're good enough. And unfortunately, you'll always have to wear um, a honors blazer in one form or another. You'll probably always have to prove, you know, to, to prove yourself. I always felt like I had to work twice as hard as the guys to get to, to where I am. And twice as hard, I worked, you know, and I pushed through and I showed that, you know, I belonged where I am now you know and constantly you constantly have to do your best you constantly have to put your best foot forward as as i've said but it's such an exciting space and um once you are in you know within the space and you've sort of proven who you are and what you're made of um look there's a lot of doors you know um the sky is the limit you know you said you're at something you know and yeah and I wish you so much luck I'm excited you sound like a very determined person you sound like you are going very far and I I, I love the well-roundedness and I must say that we have something in common I love traveling um, uh, <laughs> I actually look forward to the end of the pandemic so that I can start traveling again I really miss it and I'm so happy that you have decided you know to uh, go off the beaten path, go study somewhere else other than, you know, in South Africa, because you are learning um, so many different things. You're learning about other countries, you know, you're getting to interact with other people. And I sincerely hope that you're going to come back and practice in our country, because you're going to find that it's so different. Um, you're going to be able to take what you've learned in the States and integrate it with what we have and maybe come up with some new ideas. Maybe you, you'll be able to solve some of the issues that we have. But it is so exciting to, to practice in South Africa. And what I can tell you is we often have people coming um, into the country from the U.S., from Europe, etc., because there's things that we see that they will never see. You know, there's pathologies that we have that they will only ever see in the textbooks. So um, I encourage you to come back into the country. Um, you will see some amazing things. You will do some amazing things as well. Yeah. Uh, one of her interests uh, and, uh, is neurotrauma. Yeah. Can you she loves okay. to deal with trauma within the space of neurosurgery. Yeah, so... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just sharing that you love to deal with trauma. <laughs> Doc? Yes, and, and South Africa is the perfect place for you to, yeah. to see a lot of new trauma. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, all yeah. right, Doc, let, let's press a pause for now. Um, yeah, but thank you very much, Doc. Um, let, 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 me, let me continue. Uh, I'll call you again, all right, uh, unless you want to go now. Okay. All right. Um, um, no, it's fine. I'll, 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 I'll hang around. Okay. Thank you very much, Doc. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time. All right. So, um, so under, then you got to choose um, John Hopkins, and it's largely as a result of um, their strong neuroscience, you know, undergraduate degree. Can you tell us a little bit about this neuroscience? Because it's becoming a big thing in the space. I know also psychiatrists, you know, now they are going, uh, because we, we, we don't have a strong training in neuroscience yet. So a lot of, a lot of guys who have passed and they have become psychiatrists or even, you know, other fields, they're going to study neuroscience as a way of enriching their total knowledge. So just tell us a little bit, what, what, what is this neuroscience? Okay, um, so before I 
got to Hopkins and before I started studying neuroscience, I had a very limited understanding of what it was. I mostly thought it was you look at the brain, you look at the nervous system, and you learn why people act the way that they do, and you learn about what happens when parts of the brain stop working. That was like very much the limited scope that I had. But once I got into it, and especially more towards like second, third year, I think you you realize that neuroscience is just it's to me it's everything it's the entire body it is connected to everything within us especially like the peripheral nervous system um so like yes you do look at the brain you look at neuroanatomy you look at what aspects of the brain do in in terms of emotions or like regulating um homeostasis in the body things like that but it's also like connected to everything else like you can do you can do research in any sphere anything that you're interested in and it will probably still fall under neuroscience for so like for example I'm I do research in um, the auditory system and hearing and that is technically like what we focus on is technically outside of the nervous system it's part of the peripheral nervous system but that is still like you look at how the cells respond to sound and then how that is like transported to the brain and how the brain starts to perceive these things so neuroscience is really just the science of how you interact with the world and how all of the things that you perceive outside in terms of sight, sound, other human beings, how all of that stuff is perceived in your brain. So it's really just like the essence of everything. Yeah. Oh, the fact that, you know, everything in the body is controlled in the brain. So yeah. therefore, we actually, by understanding how the brain works, it almost gives you a sense of how every other bodily system you know, functions. Yeah. Right. So um, you have just finished your four years uh, of the BSc in neurosciences. Um, this is just about a month ago, right? Yes. What did, that, what did that mean for you? I think when it initially happened, it was just like, like I did it, I made it through the degree, it's done, on to the next chapter, um, which at that point was a little bit like, not ignorant, but like it was definitely ignoring a lot of what the degree actually meant. So especially like after I saw your post and after like talking to my parents and seeing the reaction from other people, it was more just like a culmination of decisions that like, my grandfather made and that people before me had made that had led me to this point and enabled me to actually have this degree and so now graduating from Hopkins with this degree in neuroscience is like like a, a badge for the whole family and for me to be like here it is like I want to show that I'm appreciative through this thing through this degree and show that like I don't want to waste any of the things that came before me and that I just want to like push our family forward, which I know that we're big on doing. So that's yeah. what the degree also means. But it's also like, thank goodness I did it. <laughs> I made it through. Yes, it and I mean, yeah. we mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, and even Dr. Dube mentioned this, that it's obviously a long journey ahead. But one of the things that your father um, actually taught me is that um, it's important to celebrate milestones. You know, as you are going towards your ultimate dream, you know, to be like Dr. Dube, but, you know, uh, you don't have to wait until you are a neurosurgeon before you actually take a pause uh, and actually say, wow, okay, uh, I was driving to Cape Town. Um, I'm now a third of the way in Kimberley. Let me celebrate the fact that I am here. I still have another two thirds to get to Cape Town. 
And when you get to Beaufort, uh, Beaufort West, um, that's two thirds of the way and a third to go. But you need to, you know, get to the habit of celebrating uh, successes, uh, milestones uh, towards what you want. Even in business, as somebody who's in business, um, you know, we celebrate big wins. We also celebrate small wins. We celebrate those things that are taking us to where the company wants to be. So for me, making noise, uh, you know, uh, when you graduated was part of that to say, yes, we know you've got a long journey ahead, but at this point, uh, the first step has been achieved. Uh, take a pause, you know, pat yourself in the back, you know, and uh, again, look forward and, and, and go forward. And uh, so, yeah, I hope uh, we didn't embarrass you, especially myself, I'm too loud. Uh, Dr. Dube knows that I'm, I'm quite loud about many things, but, uh, you know, I hope um, my celebrations uh, or how I celebrated you and the noise I made is nothing close to what my dad used to do, um, you know, when we were younger, where he would carry all our reports, put them in his cubby hole. And when he meets all of his teacher friends and principal friends and inspector friends, he will then tell them about each one of us to a point where if you are with him, then you would feel so embarrassed because some parents may not be so lucky to have yeah. kids who are able to achieve certain things. So by him uh, talking about those things, it may actually be causing pain to another parent who wishes that their child, you know, could be also, you know, as, um, uh, as successful uh, as, as, as he is. But at the same time, you can't not celebrate something good just because you're worrying the, about what are other people going to say. So I think it's a balance, you yeah. know, celebrate, but don't rub it in a way that it would make others feel that, uh, you know, uh, they're bad parents, they were not able to produce, uh, because there's many factors that actually uh, play a role in somebody achieving uh, that which they have set out to do from the beginning. But we need to celebrate. Uh, and that is something that your, you know, your, your father, that is my big brother, uh, actually taught me. Celebrate wins, celebrate uh, achieving milestones, but keep focused and work towards uh, you know, your dream. So um, now you have qualified uh, with your um, BSc in neurosciences and you have a year that you need to fill in before you can get to do medicine. Just tell us about this delay. Just, just for somebody who may not understand, what, what has brought this delay about? Um, so applying to medical school in the States is a very long process, unlike in South Africa, where you apply like straight out of high school. And then like once you're done high school, you go into medicine. It is like an 18 month long process the application process. So I just started it after completing all of my pre-med requirements. So I've just started it now and I will only be done maybe like in January, maybe yeah. even later. That's when I'll be done with like, so there's the primary application that you have to submit. So I submitted that at the end of May and then there's the secondary applications which you do in July and that's like you write like maybe like four to eight essays for each school that you apply to and if you're applying to like 50 schools then that's like just so many essays so that's the thing that I'll be doing during the summer and then eventually if a medical school is interested in you they invite you for interviews towards the end of the year and if not the end of the year then the beginning of the following year and then you only find out like April ish that you got in so during this time while I'm still applying and waiting to get in I will be doing a master's degree in health sciences but specifically with a focus on biochemistry and molecular biology and a lot of public health as well, I'm doing it at our School of Public Health. 
And really the idea behind doing the masters is yes, to fill in this year, but also to be a better candidate for medical school because it's very competitive. And th there are times where you don't make it in the first cycle. So you have to reapply. And so if I have this master's degree and show that I am still like academically competent and I am like well-rounded in terms of like expertise in different fields of science, but as well as like in public health and medicine, then that will make me a better candidate for the following application cycle. But also to have this master's would just be connecting science and medicine because I took a lot of science courses in my undergrad and we didn't really have a lot of classes that contextualized any of these courses in medicine or in public health. So this master's does exactly that. It combines the sciences and health and medicine. And so I think it's a good bridge between undergrad and medical school to be able to contextualize the like foundational knowledge in the field of medicine. So I'm very excited to be pursuing this master's. And hopefully, I mean, I'll definitely be able to use it in research throughout like my medical training. And it, it never hurts to know more about different things. So yeah. that's the idea behind it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and you mentioned that as part of the public health, you may also now be able to interact with different stakeholders, you know, in a city like we are in Baltimore. So, you know, different public health programs and be able to interact with decision makers. Just talk yeah. about that. So part of the masters is that we have um, like practical experiences that we can get. And the specific one that I'm interested in is one where you are able to interact with the local government and you attend the weekly meetings and you basically learn how to advocate for public health policies from the people themselves who are doing it. So I'm really excited to be hopefully be able to do that, at least like during COVID, all of those practical experiences came to a stop. But I think now as we are becoming vaccinated, hopefully those opportunities will open up. But I think it's very important to have an understanding of public health and how to push for these public health policies because at the end of the day in medicine, you need, I believe that you should be able to advocate for your patient. And sometimes that happens outside of the consultation room and outside of the treatment plan. And the way that you can do that and like effect a bigger change is if you can support and back these policies. So I definitely in the future want to be able to hold my own in front of a bunch of legislators and be yeah. able to say, I see this is what I think is important for the patients of our city and our country. So I'm very excited if that opportunity is available. All right, I'm gonna ask you a question that uh, I did not send a question to, but if, 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 if you, 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 you have a challenge with it, you know, don't, don't, don't worry. But now in South Africa, we are actually moving towards something called a national health insurance which is basically universal healthcare, where it's like one giant medical aid where everybody who's a citizen of the country, um, you know, will be able to access healthcare services without having to pay at the point of uh, access of those services. Uh, but obviously yeah. everybody who's working will contribute towards that. You know, uh, they will deduct money from employers, employers obviously deducting from employees and all of that money will be passed on to SARS, um, you know, um, SARS which is our uh, revenue service uh, and then SARS will pass it on to a new entity that will run this uh, huge big medical aid called the National Health Insurance that will then pay for everyone but anyone who's not working or indigent will then be covered by the state, that is the state will contribute there. Right, so now where you are, the, I mean, if one looks at the health outcomes in the US, um, yes. the, you know, the health outcomes in the US 
uh, whether one is looking at the number of doctors, uh, a certain number of uh, population, or you know, maternal mortality rate or neonatal mortality rate, that is the indices that indicate you know, how healthy the, the health system is. Uh, in many of these indices, Cuba, which is just across um, you know, uh, the, 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 the sea, uh, actually has got better indices and better outcomes. Okay, uh, partly because within the system there in the U.S., um, it's 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 very much the curative type of uh, healthcare service. You know, there's a mm -hmm. bigger focus on reactive or curative medicine, which is very expensive at the expense of preventative, uh, you know, uh, type of healthcare. Now, um, as South Africa, we are looking at having that preventative or primary health care as the base of the health system, but uh, with clear channels of how people must move from that primary health care towards tertiary or even higher levels of care. You know, uh, people yeah. like Dr. Dube are obviously going to be working uh, in the, you know, they are already in the tertiary or even, you know, um, I think they call it quadrinary you know, level of care. So now I'm just saying that, that most of us, we then think, oh, you know, the US was what we see, you know, when we watch the reality TVs and everything is that the health system in the US is the best. And yes, you know, in terms of, of that, but, you know, uh, the outcomes for the broader, you know, people are not so great. So the question then is, um, there is a move to try and include more people in what they call medic aid. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's called or, 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 um, Obamacare, rather. It's called Obamacare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you guys talked about that? You know, uh, I mean, what sense do you have? Obviously, you are just in that area called Baltimore. But in general, mm -hmm. what is your sense of the health system there with all its contradictions? I definitely think that being an outsider, you see the US and you think, oh, wow, everything is perfect. Everything's amazing. Everyone has access to healthcare. They have the latest treatments, et cetera, et cetera. But there are huge issues in the healthcare system. And um, I recently took a class called the Culture of Medicine that highlighted some of those issues to me um, because I did didn't really have a great understanding of what that looked like, especially because like most of my clinical experiences have been at Johns Hopkins Hospital and it is a well-funded hospital. They have access to all types of resources and treatments. So I definitely have a biased view of what it looks like to be a doctor in the States. But thanks to that class, I am more aware that that is just not the case. Um, when it comes to insurance specifically, insurance is a, a huge issue um, for healthcare in the States. And I, I'm not entirely sure. I think that Trump revoked yeah. Obama. You, you, you wanted to reverse that which uh, Obama had put in place that was supposed to include more people uh, you know, uh, into the net of uh, health insurance. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, healthcare in the States is incredibly expensive, especially for like pharmaceutical drugs, things like that. And so most people aren't able to afford the type of healthcare that they need or want, especially if you are looking for like an intensive treatment plan or like a, a chronic condition, something like that. So like, for example, if you have diabetes, um, insulin is so expensive. Like I think one dose could be like $300. And that is just not realistic for most people unless you're in the upper class. So like middle class and lower class healthcare is just not accessible for people in the United States. 
And then when you add underrepresented minorities to the mix, then it's like they are disproportionately affected because of the systems that, of course, yeah. discriminate yeah. against them. So you've got like money and then you've got race and it just it becomes a mess in terms of access to healthcare in general. Yeah. Um, because and, you know, last year, um, when one was looking at the COVID impact, uh, you know, in the US, you know, looking at the different cities, one thing that comes out is that there's a disproportionate, you know, impact in terms of um, severe illness and death amongst the African Americans, the Afri the, 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 the African Americans, yeah. um, uh, Asian Americans, the Hispanics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those minority groups, uh, which then actually says, um, the, the issue of Black Lives Matter uh, is not only just, you know, with regards to police brutality, but it's actually something that has to do also um, with access to quality healthcare. And so as you guys study there, uh, you know, those are some of the realities uh, that are actually at play. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that, um just in general, there are just a, a lot of things that need to be fixed within yeah. the system. It's definitely yeah. not a perfect system. Yeah. And it is driven by making money, yeah. especially with the pharmaceutical companies. Their drugs are crazy expensive. And insurance, if you even have insurance, doesn't cover all of that because it's such a huge price. So it, it just, the whole thing, it's not great. It's not great. The only thing that I can say is great is research, which yeah. is important to drive forward the field yeah. of medicine. But in yeah. terms of like uh, the application of medicine in the States, it's not as good as it needs to be. And so like primary care is very important because preventative medicine is what would help yeah. alleviate the medical system and also like reduce the need to awesome. rely so heavily on the medical system. And as well, like it's an aging population. There's a lot of people that are going to be getting old and going to need to get healthcare. And there aren't enough specialists in geriatrics as well, which is going to be a whole other issue. So there's just, it, it's not a stable system at all. Yeah, all right. Okay, and now there's two comments from some of our viewers. I'm gonna ask our lady to actually um, just read those two comments. And then after that, um, if you can think of a question or two for Dr. Dube, all right? We are, but let me uh, ask Nolisa to read the two comments whilst you are thinking of a question that you wanna to pose to Dr. Dube. And after that, um, as we close, um, I just want you to share you know, or motivate uh, young people back home, you know, about their dreams and following their dreams. But uh, let's, let's listen to um, Noamisa reading those two comments. Um, good afternoon again, doctors. So we have two comments, one from Nobutula Shange. Um, she wrote, I'm loving this interview. And the second one is from Gugu Gali. She says, I agree with Dr. Dube. Hope we don't lose her to the USA with a smiling emoji. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Those are the good. ones we have. Thank All you. All right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gali, uh, she was a guest on this channel a few weeks ago. Um, you know, she is a, a specialist neonatologist um based at uh, tiger Tyg hospital and university of stellenbosch in cape town um she has recently got a her phd uh, in neonatology so it's great that uh, you know she is actually listening to the show um we were together at uh, varsity doing our undergrad uh, and then you know she went a different directions spent some time in the uk uh, and back to South Africa, and uh, she is uh, one of the people who's producing more uh, other neonatologists because, again, it's a space where we've got few people in the country who are neonatologists. Um, and uh, Nobutula is a young person 
uh, who is also um, uh, finalizing her undergrad degree uh, with Nelson Mandela uh, University, I think based in George. Um, but uh, she's very entrepreneurial uh, and she will be one of my guests next week uh, as we have a panel uh, of youth uh, talking about you know, their aspirations, their frustrations, and what they think needs to be put in place. So I'm glad that there is a young person who is actually listening to you uh, because you, in my view, you are also representing the young people of uh, South Africa. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gugu, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Nogutula. All right, so now, yeah, any questions for Dr. Dube? Um, Dr. Dube, at this moment, she's actually uh, working very hard producing other uh, neurosurgeons, female neurosurgeons, all right? So she didn't go out to private practices. Um, if she does it, she'll do, she'll do it uh, as a part-time thing. But uh, she's intent on making sure that more Black females uh, become neurosurgeons in South Africa. But anyway, um, any questions that you want to pose to Dr. Dubek? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I think that some of your experiences definitely mirror what I've seen in the States as well, in terms of like, in, of all the physicians in the States, I think Black females only make up two or three percent. So it is definitely, there's a huge discrepancy between like the, what the population, the diversity of the population and how it's reflected in the faculty. And especially like at Hopkins, I did not have, I only had one black female lecturer in neuroscience. And when I looked at the faculty at the Johns Hopkins hospital, there was only one black female surgeon in the faculty. And so it was, it was difficult for me because I felt like I didn't really have people to look up to or like people for mentoring, which I think is really important along this incredibly long journey and difficult journey. So I guess my question is, I have two questions. The first is how did you motivate yourself when there is a lack of mentorship that looks like you. And also secondly, one of my goals is also to inspire young black women to enter the field of medicine in general. And I am not entirely sure of how to do that. So I would love to know what are some of the things that you are doing to do this in South Africa? Okay, so um, yeah, I, I always say that I didn't have role models as well. I didn't have any mentors. Um, so yes, I agree with you. It makes it extremely difficult. Obstacles were probably my biggest drive. You know, I, you, you know when they say use the stone strewn at you um, to build, and um, they sort of propelled me forward. The fact that I knew that I had to um, sort of prove people wrong. That was probably one of the, the, the biggest driving force for me. Um, and, you know, I would, I, I would try and get uh, answers where I could, but it's very difficult to get answers or, you know, to get motivation um, from specialities that are not your own. So basically you become your own motivation. And I like what you said in the beginning when you said, when you leave home and you go to university, you become your own um, um, inspiration. You know, you become your own driving force. And unfortunately, in our spaces, the spaces that we occupy, we have to do that uh, for ourselves. Um, we become the driving force. And um, as you go higher and higher, you will have to motivate yourself. And it's, you know, it's, it's a sad truth, but... You know, it's something that, that you need to know starting now that it'll probably okay. in terms of motivating other people, I I believe that telling people my story um is probably the biggest motivator because then it it it, it shows people that um things can be done and that um despite the circumstances, um you know you things are possible 
But more than that, um, I usually take students. So I take grade 11, 12, and usually students in first year university, and I allow them to shadow me because that's important. Um, it's all well and good for you to see um, neurosurgery on Grey's Anatomy, um, and it's looking all good and shiny and easy, and um, you don't really know what it entails. You don't know, um, you've never been in a ward round, you know? So I find that it helps um, you know, for people to get an, a clearer understanding. So they spend a week with me where I take them with me to lectures. I take them to ward rounds. I take them to, um, to theater so that at least they have a better understanding. And I try and I, you know, speak to people. If people want me to speak at a, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Webinar. realize hmm? because no, I also I realize that um, a, a lot of us don't ha have never seen black specialists you know we've never interacted with black specialists and it's important to be able to go back into the community and say hi I'm a black specialist this is what a black female specialist looks like so those are some of the things that you know that I do to help motivate young people yeah. oh and by by the way, um, you know, you said that you wanted to pursue, uh, I think you said um, um, a, a bio microbiology, was it? The master's that you wanted mm -hmm. to yeah. do? Biochemistry, oh. molecular biology. Biochemistry. biochemistry. So um, you are a girl after my own heart because <laughs> I, have a, uh, <laughs> I have a BSc degree with, uh, and I majored in chemistry and biochemistry. So um, it's invaluable, you know. Um, yeah. it, it, you, get to see, you get to see the world and you get to see the best of science. And, the, and once you do your medical degree, you get to see the best of medicine. And... Um, I can do for you know wanting to do that. Um, you'll see it's um, it, your brain works. You, you'll be working both sides of your brain when you do um, those two, when when you do the two degrees, and you'll be able to see um, the beauty in both of them, and, and 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 how they merge with each other, like you said. So I wish you luck in that. And I think you are going to love it. Thank you, yeah. Thank you so much. A, a little bit about, as we close, a little bit about Dr. Dube. You know, I'm just trying to show you that, you know, when you are focused, nothing will stop you. Now, she, um, Dr. Dube, if I can still remember some of the things, you know, um, she took a detour and did, an, you know, an undergrad degree. You know, almost in South Africa, you can go straight and do medicine. But she did BSc and then, you know, the courses that she told you about uh, before she could actually then get to go and do medicine from second year, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to final year. So that was nine years of training, all right, before she could then uh, be an intern, um, you know, community service doctor, uh, you know, a medical officer, and then go and start, you know, neurosurgery as a registrar. Even there, you know, uh, she's got stories uh, that she would tell you about how that happened. But the point I'm trying to say is that when I look at your journey, um, you know, uh, and the number of years that are before you, it can be done. It will be done. There's somebody in front of you who has actually taken almost the same number of years uh, pursuing her dream, uh, with some challenges here and there in, in terms of, you know, the environment that was not so welcoming. But if you are focused, it will definitely happen. Yeah. Any other question for Dr. Juve? Um, I guess I do have another question. Did you, so how long did you know that you wanted to do neurosurgery? And in that time before actually entering into that journey, did you have any like expectations that you had and were those met once you began your surgery or did you, were some of the things not quite what you expected? 
Okay, so um, you are lucky because you already know, you already knew that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I didn't. Um, so I, I I always say I accidentally fell in. Uh, maybe you can switch off the camera. Um, um, I met for training to be neurosurgeon. Okay, okay. So um, I met some registrars who were um, training to be neurosurgeons and one of them invited me to um, sort of just assist him for extra money, um, you know, like on weekends, et cetera. And I started assisting him. And it was then when, you know, when, when I started going and operating with him and that I fell in love with it. And that's, that's the only time when I decided that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but it's not something that I knew. Um, in medical school or during internship, oh, sorry, um, that I knew, you know, from high school or from um, um, medical school. But once once I was exposed to it, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And, you know, and, and once I started doing it, because when I started training as a neurosurgeon, um, I went for interview with um, my long blonde dreadlocks. Um, Um, and started to okay we, we lost like this is what I want in the six months I fell in love with it and decided that you know what oh you lost me oh I don't know what's going on with this um, oh, it's fine. internet can you hear me now yes <laughs> <we can hear. laughs> yeah so um when 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 I started training I fell in love with it and I had given myself six months, um, you know, in order to see if this is what I wanted to do. And in the six months, I knew that I wasn't going to leave, that this was what this was what I wanted to do. Um, so, so, like I said, despite everything that, you know, um, that was put in front of me, um, I knew that, OK, this is it for me. The You know, uh, I want to do this. Expectations, I suppose. Um, um, I thought that the a huge sack of money at the end. So when they give me my degree, yeah. they'll give me a million bucks to go with it, um, and it didn't happen. So <laughs> okay, um, so 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 that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> oh but um, yeah, expectation. <laughs> so much work you know you um you sort of think uh, people are exaggerating you know um and uh, uh, it, it was a lot harder than i thought but um in terms of expectation it's probably exceeded my expectations in a lot of ways um you know it's it's it can be very fulfilling but it also can be you know, heartbreaking. So um, it's also important to manage your, your expectations um, and, and, and just realize that what we see um, in movies and Grey's Anatomy is not always what's gonna happen. So sort of um, focus on reality and, and where you are. And um, um, yeah, manage your expectations, I think. What is it about the beauty of the brain doc that got you hooked? You always talk about the first time you saw that brain <laughs> pulsating, you got hooked. What is it? You know, most of us, the, the, the closest we know about the brain is when we are slaughtered in sheep, uh, in, 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 you know, in the rural areas. Yes. You know, I cannot describe. Yeah. You know, you, okay. as you remove, um, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's, you know, it's like, it, it, it's one of the most beautiful things that you ever see. You don't, you don't think that the, that the brain does anything. You think it's just going to be um, just a still object. But when you see it, um, you see that pulsation, you see the beauty of it. It's just, it's indescribable. Yeah. Anyway, Doc, thank you very much, man. Uh, I really appreciate the time you've spent with us.
at short notice. Um, yeah, so now I'm gonna ask Anda, you know, to actually just say something to fellow young people in South Africa, uh, you know, who have got various diverse dreams, you know, uh, some of those dreams can be pursued at home. Some of those dreams may require that they leave the country and go and pursue them elsewhere. But I think here it's about just motivating your fellow young people. Uh, I'm on the other side of 50, your dad is on the other side of 50. So we don't really understand you guys, uh, you know, <laughs> at least Dr. Duba is closer to you guys in terms of age. Um, so yeah, um, just, just talk to your fellow young people in the country. Okay, um, well, I think that at the end of the day, the most important thing to do is to work hard. And I think that that is what will allow you to achieve any of the goals that you set for yourself, even if you aren't necessarily sure about what it is that you want to do, as long as you throw your time and your passion and your energy into it, I think that that will be fruitful. It's also important to do your research in whatever it is that you want to pursue so that you know what potential obstacles you may um, face on that journey towards that goal or aspiration. And it's important to ask for help, to look to others for in terms of like emotional or like financial support, looking for scholarships, things like that. Um, all of those things will enable you to actually be able to work towards those dreams. But most importantly is find what you love and find a way to be successful with that. Or at least find a way to get that thing that is fulfilling to you in whatever it is that you want to do so that you can continue to do that throughout your life. And so you're happy with what you are choosing to do, but also don't be afraid to change your mind because I think that that's something that there isn't a lot of freedom in, in South Africa to change your mind a lot in terms of like your tertiary education. But if you know that there's just something that you need to do after you've gone out in the world and you've shadowed and you've spoken to different types of people, it's okay to change your mind and to make those choices as long as you're willing to work hard for those things. And yeah, I think that, that that's what I think is most important when it comes to achieving your goals. Thank you, thank you very much, Anda. Um, it's Father's Day here in South Africa. Um, and uh, I'm sure your father is listening somewhere. Do you have any message for him? Um, you know, uh, you guys are separated by thousands of kilometers uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, but I'm sure, um, you know, um, you would have loved to be with him here uh, in South Africa. I know you'll be coming down here uh, in not a long time for now, uh, maybe in the next two weeks or so, but it's Father's Day today. Do you have a message for him? Um, well, I think just for both of my parents in general, the time that I spend away from them, I'm always like becoming more and more appreciative of everything that they do for me. And I see how the lessons that they have taught me and just like the little things that they do, like little idiosyncrasies, I see how those things, like I've adopted those things and how they help me in my own life every day. And so I just wanna say thank you, of course, for everything. And that I'm always thinking about them, they're always in my mind and that I love them very much, but yeah. Thank you very much, Anda. Um, Dr. Dube, do you have any parting shots for her? Dr. Dube? Okay, uh, it seems like uh, there's a challenge there. But anyway, um, we were supposed to have this discussion for only 90 minutes. We've gone over 90 minutes. Um, the time has just flown like that. So I just want to thank everybody who tuned in uh, via YouTube and other social media channels. 
we had a bit of a challenge with our you know, technology that makes so that we can stream on more than one uh, social media channel, but we will um, repost this video uh, on Facebook so that people can be able to follow that as well. So I just want to say thank you to you, Anda, for agreeing. Um, we've taken almost two hours of your time. Thank you to Dr. Dube for being gracious and giving us her time at the 11th hour. Thank you to Nwanisa, who is uh, my support uh, staff, uh, to make sure that this broadcast, they go well. And thank you to everybody who was patient enough uh, to listen to this conversation. Um, I don't know, Dr. Tube, are you still around? I can see you. Um, any parting thoughts? <laughs> yes. Um, I completely honored and um, completely honored to be invited. Um, and I wish Anda all of the best. I think she's going to make an amazing um, uh, neurosurgeon. And like I said, I can't wait for her to come back into the country um, so that we can um, do some work together. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who have joined in. Um, thank you to my big brother, I know he was uh, watching via YouTube uh, and also um, my big sister, uh, Zoleka Omazozo, who was also watching. Um, and um, also my daughter, Ubuhle, uh, who looks up to Anda. Um, you know, she wants to follow in her footsteps. She wants to be a plastic surgeon. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, I don't know about these girls who want to cut up people. Uh, but anyway, uh, if that is their dream, there's nothing we can do about that. So continue shining under because there's many other uh, younger people who are looking up to you. And as you look up to those ahead of you, like uh, Dr. Dube and many others, uh, I think, uh, you know, one of my friends normally says, the future is female. Indeed, you know, the majority of people in the world are female, and it would make more sense that, you know, the world is actually led by females in almost all fields of endeavor. We as men, we have messed up so many things uh, as we took up leadership, and I think it's about time that uh, there is, you know, some change, and we see how the other gender uh, you know, is doing things. So uh, with those words, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and uh, may you enjoy your day further. Thank you, Anda. Thank you for having me. I had fun. Okay, sure. Thank you, everybody.